There are many people, such as myself, who have wondered whether dinosaurs ever really existed, especially since certain dinosaurs are so frequently used as examples of transitional forms by evolutionists to market their false hypothesis, and by telling us that they became extinct 65 million years ago. But extinction is not evolution. Dinosaurs are definitely not transitional forms, but rather a complete group of species that lived upon Earth once upon a time. Scientists are really scratching their heads about the fact that there is a distinct separate line in the fossil record where dinosaur fossils occur with no dinosaur fossils below or above them. This line is called the KT boundary and it stands for the Cretaceous Tertiary Period represented by the upper blue row in the geologic table. Now although many people wonder whether they ever really existed at all, fossil graveyards containing huge amounts of dinosaur remains have been discovered in many places worldwide. Interestingly, some of these remains have been preserved in an excellent condition. This is exactly what we would expect if they were buried suddenly under high pressure because of the flood. For example, one dinosaur family consisting of an adult, two sub-adults, two teenagers and a baby were buried together. There was no evidence of any of them being attacked or scavenged by other animals. The word dinosaur actually means terrible lizard because when scientists first discovered their bones they could see that they looked different, almost like huge lizards. However, this is a bit of a misnomer because dinosaurs were not huge lizards but they were reptiles. Many bones and dinosaur skeletons have been discovered since. To try and understand how a dinosaur looked by just having one piece of bone is like building a puzzle of which most of the pieces are missing. Consequently, sometimes scientists make mistakes. In fact, they often make mistakes. Brontosaurus was a mistake. Its name had to be changed to Apatosaurus because the scientists who discovered the skeleton placed the wrong head on top of it. The fact that he found the head six kilometers away should have been a clue that this might not be his head, but a head he had to have. The posture in which dinosaur fossils occur is also very interesting. The head is thrown back, the body is arched, the hind limbs are bent and the tail is extended upwards. The fact that so many fossils are found in this posture has troubled paleontologists for more than a century. Some have suggested that it was caused by the contraction of tendons as the dead animal dried out. But the spontaneous movement of dead animal parts have never been observed. Many paleontologists believe that dinosaurs died in water and that they were dragged into this position by fast moving water currents. However, if you look at the picture, the neck and the limbs are pointing in opposite directions. This is very unlikely in fast moving currents. Vets have also rejected this theory, especially since this posture has also been observed in fossil birds and mammals. Cynthia Marshall Fox's research on this has been affirmed by other vets and she explains how animals go into this opisthotonic posture or death throes shortly before they die, not after they die because of muscle spasms resulting from severe malfunction of the central nervous system. Simply put, a shortage, a shortage of oxygen caused them to suffocate. What could have possibly caused this on such a massive scale? The answer is simple, a worldwide flood. These fossils provide further evidence of a rapid burial under muddy layers that have since hardened to sedimentary strata that also prevented bacterial decomposition and predator action. Enormous amounts of water burst forth from the huge underground water sources. The earth's crust, crust bent and pushed up, resulting in terrible volcanic eruptions, massive earthquakes and tsunamis on a scale that has never before or since been seen on earth. 
The waves of loosened earth and vegetation and trees slid down the side of mountains, rapidly burying millions of plants and animals. So terrible was this event that all people, land animals and plants outside of the ark had died. Ecnology is the science that deals with the tracks and trails and burrows and any other traces left by living animals. It's a lot like forensic science. Further evidence of their existence are the millions of dinosaur tracks preserved in stone that have been discovered in the sedimentary strata all over the world in about 1,500 different localities. The tracks are almost always in a straight line, indicating that the animals were probably afraid and running away from something. Normal animal behavior usually results in the occurrence of meandering tracks. Geologists from the University of Utah described a remarkable collection of dinosaur tracks known as the Arizona tracks as a dinosaur dance floor because there are so many of them. A further in interesting discovery made in this area was the extremely rare fossilized tail drag marks of which there are less than a dozen in the world. Dinosaur tracks have also been discovered in coal layers in the Colorado mines of the USA. Radiometric dating have confirmed the age of these layers to be only a few thousand years old. Dinosaurs were land reptiles, plesiosaurs were water reptiles, and pterosaurs were flying reptiles. So have people ever seen them? There have been several reports of people who claim to have seen dinosaur type animals alive. These reports center around some of the most remote jungles in the world, places not normally visited by people. For example, locals in the Congo in Africa are apparently very familiar with the Mokele Mbembe, which they identified from fossil reconstructions as being similar to a small Apatosaurus. People's description of these dinosaur encounters are usually very detailed sometimes even with illustrations. I think it is something we'll all write down if we bumped into a dinosaur one day on Twitter and on Facebook. Whether it's true, however, is not a foregone conclusion. Yet there is a lot of information available about people who claim to have seen live dinosaurs. Worldwide, there are historical references to dragons and the description of these animals mostly agree with modern scientific reconstructions of dinosaur fossils. In 900 AD an Irish writer gave a full description of an encounter with a stegosaurus. You can read all about that in the book The Great Dinosaur Mystery and the Bible. In another writing from England dated 1405 AD a dragon is described in vivid detail and also how it devoured a whole bunch of sheep. You can read more about that in Cooper's book After the Flood, Flood History of Europe Traced Back to Noah. We'll look at some more evidence a little later in this lecture. The word dinosaur was only devised in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. It is therefore a modern word which doesn't occur in the English translation of the Bible because these translations were done years before between 1500 and 1600 AD. In other words, before Sir Richard Owen devised the word dinosaur. Although the word dinosaur is not mentioned in the Bible, the word dragon does occur more than 20 times in the King James Version. And since there were no death before the fall, dinosaurs could not have lived and died before humans. The, the water living dinosaurs, the plesiosaurs, as well as the flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, were created on day five. The land dwelling dinosaurs were created on day six, together with all the other land animals and mankind. As people and animals started to spread across the earth after the flood, from time to time they encountered dragons or dinosaurs. Most of the large dinosaurs were herbivores, plant eaters, and many of the carnivorous dinosaurs spent their time preying mainly on them. And this also explains why dinosaurs lived with people before the flood without posing a significant threat to them. After the flood, 
Animals and people began to fear each other, which coincides with the commission in Genesis 9 that humans were then given permission to eat meat, which is probably the reason why they ha were hunted to the point of possible extinction. Now remember, God did not instruct Noah to take one pair of every animal kind on earth on board, but only land animals that breathed air and seven pairs of the clean kind. Furthermore, only the original kind was taken on board, not every species, subspecies and variation of today. So yes, there were dinosaurs on board the ark. Dinosaurs were simply another land animal that breathed air and that was created on day six. And as mentioned in the previous lecture, most dinosaurs weren't even that big at all. So let's quickly repeat that information. Some were even smaller than chickens. The average size of an adult dinosaur was approximately that of a sheep. Of the 668 so-called dinosaur genera, only 106 of them weighed more than 10 tons when they were adults. The reason why I say so-called dinosaur genera is because there is a very high probability that this figure has been seriously overestimated. However, Woodmore was overly generous to the skeptics and he used this number anyway when he calculated the number of animals on board the ark. The largest egg ever hatched by a dinosaur was only slightly larger than a football, which tells us that even the biggest dinosaurs, for example the Apatosaurus, used to be small, just like you and me. The younger and therefore smaller animals would have easily fitted into the ark. The average size of all the animals on board was probably that of a large size rat, while only 11% of the animals in the ark were substantially larger than a sheep. Flying reptiles such as the pterodactyls were also on the ark, but of course no sea reptiles such as the plesiosaurs. It is commonly believed that dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. However, Genesis teaches that God made all the land animals, including dinosaurs, on day 6, approximately 6,000 years ago. And according to God's word, nothing died before Adam and Eve sinned. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus spread to all men because all sinned. And like I said in the previous lecture, if you choose to believe the word of God in its entirety, that should be sufficient to distinguish the blinding evolutionary light right there. But if you're still wondering, listen further. It's interesting to note that in contrast to mammals that stop growing once they reach adulthood, reptiles continue growing for as long as they live. It follows that the longer they lived, the larger they grew. In the Encyclopedia Britannica we read as follows. The significant difference between growth in reptiles and that in mammals is that a reptile has the potential of growing throughout its life, whereas a mammal reaches a terminal size and grows no more even though it may subsequently live many years in ideal conditions. Researchers studying growth rings in dinosaur bones indicated that dinosaurs undergo a kind of teenage growth spurt. Makes me think of my teenage son. The Apatosaurus was used as an example. This animal had a rapid growth phase commencing from the age of about five years when it weighed only one ton. During the faster growth phase, the animal grew with an astonishing five tons per year. That is the size of an elephant, an adult elephant per year. This growth spurt started to decline at an age of 12 to 13, when the animal weighed approximately 25 tons. That is the equivalent of five elephants. Other species showed the same S-shaped growth curve as displayed on this graph. Now this rapid growth phase would probably have occurred shortly after the animals left the ark. Therefore the animals would have grown larger faster than the animals preying on them. Also dinosaurs didn't need to be fully grown before they could reproduce. In 2005 Mary Schweitzer announced the first definitive method of sexing dinosaur fossils. The key was medullary tissue she found in the thigh bone of a young, relatively small, Tyrannosaurus rex. 
In birds, medullary bone serves as a reservoir for the large amounts of calcium that make eggshells. This lines the bone marrow and keeps them from losing calcium from their bones when, when it is used to make eggshells. The tissue only appears in the bones of females shortly before they lay their eggs. Female dinosaurs have been discovered to have medullary tissue in their bones, but this tissue has also been found in dinosaurs that were not fully grown. It follows that dinosaurs didn't need to be fully grown before they could reproduce. Now there's a place in the Bible where two dinosaurs are described in great detail by God himself and that is in Job 40 and 41. Within a few years after the flood, God gave Job a firm reminder of his great creative power by referring to this animal. Clearly, this animal was alive in Job's day, otherwise God's description of probably the largest land animal would have made no sense. Some Bible scholars thought it was an elephant because of its size, while others thought it was a hippopotamus due to the fact that it lives in the marsh. However, the fossil record clearly confirms the fact that the elephant was definitely not the largest land animal made by God. Elephants are dwarfed by some of the largest dinosaurs. Let's read. Take a look at Behemoth, which I made, just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly. Its tail is as strong as a cedar. The sinews in its thighs are knit together tightly. Its bones are beams of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. The mountains offer it their best food, where all the wild animals play. It lies under the lotus plants hidden by the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants give it shade among the willows beside the stream. It is not disturbed by the raging river, not concerned when the swelling Jordans rushes around it. No one can catch it off guard or put a ring in its nose and lead it away. Now the tail of this animal is compared to that of a cedar tree. This is a strong indication that this animal was enormous in size. Now look at these two pictures and compare these tails. Neither the short little stump of the hippopotamus nor the cord-like tail of the elephant is comparable to the strong, large shape of a cedar tree. The description of this animal is very similar to that of a Brachiosaurus. And as you can see, elephants and hippos are dwarfed by the enormous size of this animal. Furthermore, in Job 41, reference is made to a Leviathan. Job 1 and 2 tells the story of Satan, who claimed that Job was only faithful to God because he benefited from this relationship. Satan argued that when Job's property and people is taken away, Job would turn against God. God allowed Satan to take Job's possession and people, but Job remained faithful. Satan came back to God and claimed that Job would become unfaithful when his health was taken away as well, not only his possessions. The rest of Job describes the story of how he struggled to make sense and understand why all these terrible things came upon him. Many theologians say that it is incomprehensible that after Satan lodged all these complaints, he is not mentioned again in the book of Job, and the story seems to end with a lot of loose ends. If, however, one should read the description of Leviathan, which is probably based on a specific created animal that is used as a symbol for Satan, just as a dragon and a snake is used in other places as a symbol for Satan, then it becomes clear that this description of a real and existing animal literally referred to Satan. So God explains to Job, after he switched his attention to all the wonderful aspects of his creation, such as the behemoth, which was the first of the land animals, that only he, who is God, can overcome Satan, also a created being. Let's read. This is a bit of a long piece, but it's important to see exactly what the Bible says. 
Can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore you for pity? Will its hide be hurt by spears or its head be by a harpoon? If you lay a hand on it, you will certainly remember the battle that follows. You won't try that again. No, it's useless to try to capture it. The hunter who attempts it will be knocked down. And since no one dares to disturb it, who then can stand up to me? Who has given me anything that I need to pay back? Everything under heaven is mine. I want to emphasize Leviathan's limbs and its enormous strength and graceful form. Who can strip off its hide and who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Who could pry open its jaws for its teeth are terrible. Its scales are like rows of shields tightly sealed together. They are so close together that no air can get in between them. Each scale sticks tight to the next. They interlock and cannot be penetrated. When it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a pot heated over burning rush rushes. Its breath would kindle coals, for flames shoot from its mouth. The tremendous strength in the Viton's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Its heart is hard as a rock, hard as a millstone. When it rises, the mighty are afraid, gripped by terror. No sword can stop it, no spear, dart or javelin. Iron is nothing but straw to that creature and bronze is like rotten wood. Arrows cannot make it flee. Stones shot from a sling are like bits of grass. Clubs are like a blade of grass and it laughs at the swish of javelins. Its belly is covered with scales as sharp as glass. It plows up the ground as it drags through the mud. Leviathan makes the water boil with its commotion. It stirs the depth like a pot of ointment. The water glistens in its wake, making the sea look white. Nothing on earth is its equal. No other creature so fearless. Of all the creatures, it is the proudest. It is the king of the beasts. Not the lion, after all. Now, before we attempt to identify this animal, let's first have a look at the bombardier beetle. It is rare in Europe and common in Africa, Asia and the warmer parts of the USA. Did you know that this little beetle, Brachina species, is able to fire a steaming hot 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling temperature of water, noxious gas through twin tubes in his tail in any direction his enemy might be. He can even aim and fire over his head. This is done by mixing all sorts of concoctions, chemicals and catalysts in a bomb generation or reaction chamber in its hindquarters. Now, this bomb preparation chamber is a bit more dangerous than yours. These chemicals can only produce an explosive reaction when mixed together under the influence of a special enzyme catalyst. When the beetle is threatened, the muscles around the two chemical storage chambers contract the chemicals flow into the reaction chamber via intake valves. The pressure mounts due to the reaction between the chemicals, which causes the one-way valves to close and immediately causes the outlet valves to open again with a loud pop. One pop is actually a sequence of tiny, rapidly successive explosions. Now, the reaction between the chemicals happens very rapidly within 90 milliseconds before spearing out at 20 meters per second. This tiny insect cannon can fire off four to five of these bombs at intervals of less than four minutes. The bomb can even render larger enemies such as spiders, mice, frogs, and even birds temporarily unconscious. So the little beetle has time to make its great escape. Now we'll talk more about this remarkable beetle again in our very last lecture and we'll also look at a DVD or a video showing how this mechanism works. If this mechanism is still in existence today, surely it is more than possible that it existed in the past as well. 
There are many different ideas regarding the identity of this animal. Some thought it was a Chronosaurus or a T-Rex or a normal crocodile. By the way, crocodile scales today are not nearly thick enough to withstand a spear. CMI proposes that it is probably a Sarcosuchus imperata, a monstrous armored type of crocodile with the name Supercroc. The first Sarcosuchus imperata fossil was discovered in the Sahara Desert in 1964. A further five fossil remains were discovered in the Tania Desert, Nigeria in 2000 and 2001. This animal had an unusual ball-shaped opening at the front of its snout. It is speculated that it might have been the preparation chamber for the mixture of various fire-generating chemicals very similar to what was described previously in the Bombardier Beetle. An article on this discovery was dis presented in the December 2001 publication of National Geographic. The description of the animal is remarkably similar to that which is given in Job. The skin is described as gorgeous armor with foot-long bony scales that look like roofing tiles very densely packed to form an impenetrable shield around the animal's neck, back and tail. They write that it is especially the skull with which nothing else can be compared. More than a hundred teeth are in that mouth and in contrast to crocodiles alive today, the skull of supercroc becomes wider towards the front where it is further armed with an, a row of enlarged deadly canines. The force of the bite is estimated at 8 tons. Just for interest sake, humans will tear into their stakes with a bite force of about 120 kilos. Hyenas bite into their bones at 918 kilos and a saltwater crocodile will have a bite force of around 1.6 tons. So clearly super croc was in a biting class of its own. The most complete skull is almost two meters in length from front to back. Now this 13 meter long armored reptile with a two meter long head and frightening teeth, eight ton bite force that possibly breathed out smoke and fire, sounds like an excellent candidate for the Leviathan of the Bible, don't you think? So let's ask the question again. Have people ever seen dinosaurs? Doctors Don Patton and Dennis Swift discovered carvings of a dinosaur, a Stegosaurus, dating from 1186 AD on the outer wall of the Cambodian temple of Talprom. Copper engravings dating back to the 1400s can be seen in the Carlisle Cathedral in the UK. These engravings of dinosaurs are so clear that even a small child would easily recognize it as such. The dinosaurs are depicted with animals such as fish, a dog with a collar, a pig, a bird and other familiar animals. How can you draw or make an engraving of something in such detail if you've never seen it before? And remember, the dinosaur fossils were only discovered much later in the early 1800s? The answer is clear. People knew what they looked like because those animals were alive at the same time, together with other familiar animals. Unfortunately, some initially plausible evidences for man's contemporaries with dinosaurs have later turned out to be mistaken. Ever since their discovery, huge controversy has re reigned regarding the Ica stones in South America depicting humans and dinosaurs together. As stated in the book, critics initially, without any evidence, declared that these were modern reproductions, in other words, not authentic, because they believed that it was impossible for dinosaurs to have lived with humans. The mystery regarding the stones has since been cleared up, and it has been shown to be a fraud. It turns out that an unscrupulous Peruvian surgeon had purchased the stones from a local artist and he installed them in his museum, claiming them to be ancient artifacts. The artist himself makes these stones for tourists and he never claimed them to be ancient. 
The Institute of Geological Sciences in London has since examined one of the stones and confirmed their modern origin. Then we have the Alvis Delk object. It contains a human footprint overlying a dinosaur footprint. Alvis Delk and Karl Bach claim that it is a Cretaceous fossil. The object has been investigated by numerous creationists and although it would be wonderful if this were true, all agreed that it was a fabrication. Because of the fact that certain people continue to promote non-credible evidence, which do not stand up to critical scrutiny, their work is not published by credible creationist organizations such as CMI. Promulgating unreliable evidence negatively impacts one's reputation and credibility. And the most important point here is that we should be committed to distributing the truth about the biblical record of creation, the fall and the flood. But we should refrain from distributing misinformation in the name of Christ. In an earlier lecture, I mentioned that many dinosaur remains are still not completely turned to stone. In fact, more than half of the fossil is usually still original bone, not stone. They are very interesting biological discoveries confirming the young age of dinosaurs. Moreover, these discoveries were made by an evolutionist named Mary Schweitzer, whom we referred to earlier, as well as her team. Amongst other things, they discovered soft tissue, red blood cells and flexible blood vessels in dinosaur bone. It caused quite a stir in their laboratory, to say the very least. And Dr. Schweitzer herself admitted that she could not believe it until they repeated the experiment 17 times. Based on known biological laws, soft tissue cannot remain intact soft and stretchy for 65 million years. And it is not just dinosaur soft tissue either, but also the presence of detectable proteins such as collagen and hemoglobin, complex molecules that continuously tend to break down to simpler ones. The set measurable rate of decomposition of certain proteins is entirely consistent with an age of about 4,500 years since the flood, but definitely not in harmony with millions of years. To physically observe not only proteins, but also microstructures of cells after 4,500 years is already amazing, considering the fact that bacteria normally attack these structures quite easily. However, believing that proteins could last for tens of millions of years requires an enormous leap of faith. According to a report in the journal, The Biochemist, even collagen, even if collagen was stored at zero degrees Celsius, it would not be expected to last even three million years. Many still seem to choose to believe in the impossible evolutionary fairy tale. Schweitzer should have drawn the logical conclusion that these bones are young. But because of her blinding evolutionary worldview, her colored lenses, she will not even consider the possibility because in her eyes, dinosaurs must be 65 million years old. Actually, her own words describes this the best. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course, I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones are, after all, 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? Fairly recently, there has been a spate of popular articles claiming that Dr. Schweitzer may have found the solution to the soft tissue problem. She suggested that the iron-containing hemoglobin molecule in red blood cells may have helped to preserve and conceal ancient proteins within dinosaur tissue. She tested this idea and we need to briefly clarify her conclusions as quoted from her technical paper. Hemoglobin increased tissue stability more than 200 fold from approximately three days to more than two years at room temperature. As stated by Calvin Smith, it is the 
seeming simplicity of this argument that gives it its power to appease an uninformed public. The reality is that even under modern scrutiny, Dr. Schweitzer's explanation quickly falls to pieces. In her new paper, she discusses experiments that are totally unrepresentative of the conditions under which dinosaur remains were actually preserved. Because they actually soaked one group of ostrich blood vessels in iron-rich liquid made of red blood cells and another group in water. Of course, the blood vessels in the water turned into a disgusting mess within just a few days, while those soaked in red blood cell concentration remained recognizable at room temperature after two years. Pure hemoglobin was used, not materials that could be expected to mimic what would be present in an animal carcass. In other words, Blood vessels soaked in laboratory prepared hemoglobin is certainly not representative of decomposing bones. How realistic is a concentrated hemoglobin extract compared to the real world? While it is true that concentrated hemoglobin might preserve for some time, it does not follow that natural dilute hemoglobin will act in the same way. A practical example of this is lungs and gills, tissues that are rich in blood vessels, yet they decay very quickly. The suggestion that the blood vessels remained recognizable for two years, that it somehow demonstrates that these could last 35 million times as long, requires much faith. Some would unknowingly compare the preservative abilities of iron to that of formaldehyde. But even embalmers of human bodies would acknowledge that their use of formaldehyde is to slow down, not prevent the relentless process of decomposition. It's quite possible that the hemoglobin in Schweitzer's experiment pickled the blood vessels so that neither bacteria nor enzymes could degrade them. This requires a concentrated solution of the pickling agent, usually salt and acidic conditions. If this is the real explanation, then a dilute solution as normally found in tissues would not work anyway. But that's not all. DNA is the genetic material we inherit from our parents, as you are well aware of by now. The discovery of DNA in dinosaur bones presents an even bigger problem for long age fans. In estimates done to determine how long DNA can remain stable before it decays, an upper limit of 125,000 years was set at 0 degrees Celsius, 17,500 years at 10 degrees Celsius, and 2,500 years at 20 degrees Celsius. More recent research indicate that even if DNA could last as much as 400 times longer in bone, as discussed in a fairly recent paper, it is still not nearly enough to account for the proposed dinosaur extinction of, at 65 million years ago. Schweitzer's team detected DNA in three independent ways and even DNA in its double-stranded form indicating that it was well preserved. They also detected a specific protein called histone H4. Not only is the discovery of yet another protein a problem for long ages, but this is a specific protein for DNA. The DNA of an organism that has died can only last for a few thousand years, whereafter it can no longer be detected. In the prestigious journal Nature, Brian Sykes stated that the rate at which DNA breaks down in the laboratory is such that no DNA should be left after 10,000 years. DNA has however been discovered in bacteria that are supposedly 425 million years old, according to evolutionists. Furthermore, carbon-14 has been discovered in their bones. We will be talking about carbon-14 in, detail, in detail in a later lecture. But just briefly, everything that is or that was alive contains carbon-12 and carbon-14. Carbon-14 is radioactive. 
When the organism dies, the carbon-14 within the organism commences with radioactive decay. This simply means that the carbon-14 becomes less and less and less. The less remaining within the organism, the longer ago it died. When we discover carbon-14 in anything, we are always very excited because carbon-14 disappears so fast. And this is why we could, would not expect to find even one carbon-14 atom within a dinosaur carcass. Since after only a th about 60,000 years, less than 0.0001%, in other words, a thousandth remains. If dinosaurs are really millions of years old, not even one carbon-14 atom should be present within them. In August 2012, a team of scientists delivered a presentation at the Western Pacific's Ge Geophysics meeting in Singapore. They presented the results of carbon-14 dating on the bones of eight dinosaur species. The calculated ages range from 22,000 to 39,000 years, completely within the framework as proposed by creationists. And this will make more sense to you when we do that lecture. It seems as though the researchers approached the matter in an extremely professional manner, including taking every possible precaution to eliminate possible contamination by more recent carbon as a source for the carbon-14 in the bones. The lead presenter was Dr. Thomas Seiler, a German physicist, and the video can be seen on that link. Extremely interesting is the fact that the abstract, which is a summary in the program referring to these results, was removed by two chairmen of the conference because they could not accept the carbon-14 findings in dinosaurs. They were not prepared to challenge the data openly, which is why they quietly removed it from the conference website out of the public eye without one word to the authors or even to the AOGS of officers until the data could be further investigated, according to them. Interesting. Some of the most recent articles in the science journal suggest that the origin of dinosaurs is still unknown. But paleontologists are equally concerned with puzzling out how these mighty beasts got their start. Who were their ancestors? Tracing the origins of the earliest dinosaurs has been a major challenge for paleontologists because there are no uncontested fossils from their earliest days on Earth. Evolutionary researchers were shocked to discover the remains of at least five different types of grasses in fossilized dinosaur feces. The mere fact that fossilized feces were discovered testifies to a rapid burial and conditions devoid of oxygen. How could the feces otherwise have been preserved so well? Furthermore, based on the standard evolutionary time scale, grasses were only supposed supposed to have evolved 55 million years ago. That is 10 million years after the dinosaurs supposedly became extinct. So how could the dinosaurs eat something that according to evolutionists was not supposed to exist yet? Mm -hmm. The Morrison Formation of the Western USA appears to represent a vast but incomplete ecological system. It is one of the world's richest sources of dinosaur fossils, yet plants are very rare, especially in the vicinity of the dinosaur remains. But what did the giant behemoth eat then? Paleontologist Theodore White writes as follows. Although the Morrison Plain was an area of reasonably rapid accumulation of sediment, identifiable plant fossils are practically non-existent. An Apatosaurus would consume 3.5 tons of green fodder daily. If dinosaurs lived for millions of years, what did they eat if plants were so rare? The absence of evidence for abundant plant life in the form of coal beds and organic rich clays in much of the Morrison formation is puzzling. However, if this is a flood created dinosaur burial ground, plants would have been sorted and carried elsewhere. 
The same problem is found in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia and the Coconino Sandstone near the top of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Hundreds of footprint trackways, probably amphibian and reptile, occur in the lower half, yet no plants. If it took millions of years to form the Coconino, what nourishment was available for the animals that made these tracks? The popular idea that birds evolved from the reptiles is also false. According to their own dates, the fossils of bird-like dinosaurs, the so-called predecessors of birds, were millions of years younger than the well-known Archaeopteryx fossil, often touted as the missing link between the two groups. However, it is quite clear that Archaeopteryx was a bird, and no paleobabbling is going to change that. The fact that it had teeth is completely irrelevant. A whole bunch of extinct birds had teeth as well, as well as and many reptiles had no teeth at all. That strange bird, Archaeopteryx, with a long lizard-like tail, bearing a pair of feathers on each joint and with wings furnished with two free claws, has been discovered in the Ulitic states of Sullenhofen. Hardly any recent discovery shows more forcibly than this how little we as yet know of the former inhabitants of the world. And who is talking here? It is Darwin. Please note, not one word from Darwin about it being what he so desperately needed, an intermediate between reptiles and birds. The first dinosaur proposed in 1996 as evidence of bird evolution is Sinusoropteryx prima. Four paleontologists discovered that the so-called feathers were simply a parallel arrangement of collagen fibers. These also occur in many other types of fossilized animals such as pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, other reptiles and dolphins. Clearly these collagen fibers are not limited to or unique to dinosaurs. Not all evolutionists believe that birds arose from dinosaurs. However, some are so totally unwilling to reject the idea that they've now decided that birds arose from reptiles named crocodilomorphs. They propose that these small crocodilian reptiles lived in trees, where at first they jumped from tree to tree, where after they miraculously started to glide. The idea of the advancement from simple parachute jumping to gliding to wing flapping flight could not have occurred unless a completely new body design arose from somewhere. The ability to fly with flapping wings requires that the brain be programmed for it. This again requires a completely new set of genetic information that a non-flying animal does not have. Feathers are not altered scales. Scales differ completely from feathers in structure as well as the way in which they originate. It is quite clear that the formation of a wing requires a genetic code that differs completely from that of scales. Remember, it takes more than feathers to make a bird. A 10-page full-color article with illustrations was featured in the November 1999 publication of the National Geographic magazine. In this article, it was declared that irrefutable proof has been discovered for the evolution of dinosaurs into birds. An Archaeoraptor was presented as proof of feathered dinosaurs, and thus the dinosaur to bird transitional form. The article had an illustration of a young T. rex with feathers as well, as well as many other dinosaurs that suddenly received a covering of feathers. The article's promotion of the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs attracted fierce criticism, even from the evolutionist camp. Storrs Olson, curator of birds at the National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, wrote the following. National Geographic has reached an all-time low for engaging in sens sensationalistic, unsubstantiated, tabloid journalism. 
It eventually became clear to me that National Geographic was not interested in anything other than the prevailing dogma that birds evolved from dinosaurs. On page 100 and 105 it reads as follows. It's a missing link between terrestrial dinosaurs and birds that could actually fly. We can now say that birds are pteropods, a type of dinosaur, just as confidently as we say that humans are mammals. But then the bad news arrived. As with so many previous so-called transitional forms or evidences, it was once again a fraud. An opportunistic Chinese farmer who discovered various sets of bones in an old barn managed to arrange the bones in such a manner that he was able to convince a, a potential buyer that the tail of a seemingly legitimate dinosaur belonged to an unidentified type of bird. But the biggest joke was how many clever scientists were fooled by it. To see what this fake looked like, please Google Archaeoraptor National Geographic. A paleontologist from Beijing named Zhu Xing now claims that the fossil is not authentic or genuine. It's rather interesting know, though that Zhu Xing was one of the original scientists who investigated this fossil. Archaeoraptor Liangolensis was actually a composite, a combination of the body and head of a bird type creature and the tail of another dinosaur. In due course and further studies showed that this fossil was a doctored combination of up to five separate specimens. In the March 2000 publication, National Geographic recanted and gave a rectification of the earlier article hidden in small print in the somewhat obscure forum section. After observing a new feathered dromosaur and comparing it with a fossil known as Archaeoraptor, I have concluded that Archaeoraptor is a composite, a dromosaur tail and a bird body, Zhu Xing is one of the scientists who originally examined Archaeoraptor. So why did they go extinct? Many possibilities have been suggested for the extinction of the dinosaurs, including volcanic eruptions, climate change, as well as egg predation by small animals. However, far more delicate types of game have survived volcanic eruptions, climate change and egg predation. Further possibilities that have been considered include the impact of meteorites, overheating or starvation, poisoning through newly evolved plants, the evolution of poisonous insects that stung the dinosaurs into extinction, the poisoning of water through chemicals, the evolution of moths and butterflies of which their larvae stripped the vegetation bare, leading to the extinction of herbivore dinosaurs and therefore the extinction of the carnivorous dinosaurs as well, a change in Earth's gravitation, radioactive poisoning, a decrease in di carbon dioxide, an increase in oxygen, etc., etc. There are also a whole bunch of far-fetched proposals including extinction due to parasites, hormonal disorders, shrinking brains, becoming too large, cataracts, that they simply lived long enough, poisonous gases, sunspots, comets, mass suicide, and my personal favorite, chronic constipation. Clearly, many ideas have been proposed to try and explain the extinction of the dinosaurs, yet evolutionists simply cannot provide an acceptable solution to this mystery. One of the most popular is the meteorite impact theory. The evidence for this is contained in the presence of a worldwide layer of clay at the KT boundary, which contains a high amount of iridium. The Earth's crust is depleted in iridium and comets also have a low abundance thereof, while meteors are enriched in iridium. 
It is proposed that a meteor with a 10 kilometer diameter injected 60 times its mass in pulverized rock into the stratosphere. This caused a cooling trend that wiped out approximately 50% of all living organisms, including dinosaurs. Others propose that the impact caused a sudden short time rise in temperature. There are currently around 150 probable impact craters on Earth. Mike Ord, an atmospheric scientist and meteorologist, agrees that most of the iridium anomalies, meaning that it anomalies meaning anomalies, meaning that it deviates from the mean, were caused by the meteorite impacts during the flood. The reason is that the crater, which formed by meteorite impact during the flood, is expected to have eroded greatly while also being filled with sediments. Only the vague circular outline with little or no detectable remnant particles is expected to be visible. If it occurred after the flood, one would expect to see relatively sharp outlines as well as visible remnant particles. Since most of the impact craters are barely detectable in the flood sediments, it is very likely that most impacts occurred during the flood. Some have proposed that the meteorite impact triggered the flood. Many evolutionists agree with the fact that the high iridium content could also have been caused by volcanic activity. This is in agreement with the breaking up of the fountains of the Great Deep and confirmed through evidence of massive volcanism around the KT boundary. It was further explained how all the dinosaurs, except those in the Ark, were wiped out and buried during the flood. The worldwide occurrence of dinosaur graveyards provides further evidence of this catastrophic event. The largest bone graveyard in the world is located in north central Montana, USA, where approximately 10,000 duckbill dinosaurs are entombed in a thin layer over an area of 2 kilometers by 0 0.5 kilometers. The bones are completely disassociated and the violence of this event is described as follows by Horner and Gorman. How could any mudslide, no matter how catastrophic, have the force to take a two or three ton animal that had just died and smash it around so much that its femur, still embedded in the flesh of its thigh, split lengthwise. The meteorite impact theory poses far more questions than solutions, even to the evolutionists. One of them being the fact that the evolutionary dinosaur extinction date does not coincide with the age of the craters formed by the meteorite. We also have to ask why environmentally sensitive plants and animals such as frogs and tropical plants survived. But the dinosaurs, which were apparently very well adapted to various environmental conditions, became extinct. How peculiar that dinosaurs are so regularly presented in museums as so-called superior evidence of evolution, while in reality they do not prove anything at all relating to evolution. None of them evolved from nor into anything else. They are clearly a separate species and their sudden e extinction can in no way be explained by the evolutionary hypothesis. From a biblical perspective, there is no mystery at all surrounding the extinction of the dinosaurs. The sedimentary rock layers which contain the evidence of dinosaur fossils are not an evolutionary record of extinction over millions of years, but rather a legacy, proof of the largest burial that ever took place on Earth. One pair of every kind of land animal, including dinosaurs and also birds, survived in Noah's Ark, filling the Earth again after the flood. Since that time, many different animals became extinct, not only the dinosaurs, as a constant reminder of the serious effect of sin. As in the case with the dodo of Mauritius, it is more than possible that dinosaurs became extinct due to human impact, especially since people saw them as such a threat. If such a huge number of scientists were not stuck in their millions of years indoctrination, 
they would have had no problem with the fact that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time until the dinosaurs gradually disappeared. In the next lecture, we will look at the hypothesis of human evolution. Thank you very much.